Hey, everybody, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. We're a podcast about old books, old ideas, and generally classical things, trying to bring all of that to you as painlessly and enjoyably as possible. Uh, We are three teachers from a school in Austin, Texas called Veritas Academy. My name is AJ Hannenberg, and I am joined by my colleagues, Thomas Magby. Hello. And Graham Donaldson. Hello. And we are... (laughs) Why are you giggling? I was trying to mimic it, uh, Thomas. Oh, okay. How'd you do? Do you think on a scale of one to ten? Write in. Let us know. (laughs) Please email us and let us know. (laughs) Okay. And today we will be talking about, um, uh, apparently, monster government. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. How monsters interrelate with each other and... Mm -hmm. Who gets to be in charge? I would assume it's the one with, you know, the min- the most heads, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So fair. heads of state mm-hmm. makes a lot Ooh, more there sense. You go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You need, like the Hydra is uh, hail Hydra. As many as many <laughs> no, heads no, of state. No, no, wait, no. <laughs> we do not hail Hydra on this podcast. But the Hydra's really nice, okay. and like think about that internal dialogue. Like he he can he can have his own internal. He can dialogue. have his own. He's I believe it's own, external at that point, he's right? His own right? counselor. Does, uh, do they have yeah, he has brain? his own counselors. Hmm. I think each head has its own brain, doesn't it? I, I don't know. I've never met a Hydra. Oh, man. I bet Hydras are really just ineffective at everything. That's fair. Yeah. Like when they go shopping, Can't it's agree just on anything. A, yeah, a lot of yelling. Hmm. That's fair. Is that actually what you're and every about? time, <laughs> And every time a head gets cut off and two more grow back, all the other Hydras are like, oh, oh, come on, one more? It just gets worse. Come on. Yeah, um, that is kind of what we're talking. We are talking a little <laughs> bit about government. That was a very polite um, response. No, this is st- this stemmed. So we are teaching. I'm teaching Frankenstein right now to my tenth graders, and we are reading this passage. And we are re- I read this passage to my students, and I didn't spend any time talking about it. We, we we I continued on with sort of the 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 things that I was talking about in class. But the passage sort of struck me, and it made me realize um, that it is a uh, it was a passage that sort of not betrayed, but showed Mary Shelley's view of government or the reason why we have government and we have laws. And it's a pretty familiar one. And um, I, I was sort of thinking about it in between classes and when the students sort of went off and on my on my walk home and all that. And I, I was just sort of, I, I, this passage sort of, I've been thinking about it and it, it led me to think about just that there are different reasons and different sort of um, uh, conceptions of why human beings have government. There's sort of an older one, which I would sort of posit as a medieval one. And then there would be the one that I think we would be most familiar with. And I think maybe it's probably fair to call it the modern one. And so the thesis that I have for this podcast, usually my podcast don't have a thesis, but I kind of, I, I'm humbly submitting a thesis that I actually think the book Paradise Lost, so I know that's different for Frankenstein. I actually think that Paradise Lost is... Uh, uh, something else that's going on in that story is um, Milton is wrestling with or is confronting the up the, the sort of the clash of these two views of government together that's happening in his time. So he's writing around the time of the English Civil War, and I kind of feel like he has care- uh, Satan. This is an idea I've been kicking around for a while that Satan is in many ways a modern thinker, um, <laughs> sort of planted in this medieval world or planted in this world of of the medieval cosmos and he hates it Mm -hmm. and then so this is where this clash comes in anyway that's kind of the thesis i have maybe we'll see if we i don't know if we can get to that but you know every one of our seniors is wondering like where's the narratio (laughs) donald's exactly right (laughs) yeah sorry where's the partidio lay out those three points for me Um, anyway so that's the the kind of the conception the idea i have for this let me just read the passage from frankenstein uh that sort of that was that launched this all these little ships towards troy well, that's a mixing metaphor. So let me just read this passage. So this is happening where the monster is watching the family in his little hovel. And this is where he's learning to read. Uh, if you're confused as to what I'm talking about, you can go back and listen to an old Frankenstein podcast that we did many moons ago. Um, but the monster learns to read and write basically by observing human beings. And in many ways, and, and just if you, if you read the book um, with a... Um, an eye for maybe what Mary Shelley thinks about children or thinks about upbringing. There's very much like a tabula rasa thing going on. The monster is sort of this blank slate. And as he observes human beings, that's what, um, that's how he sort of, he gets his worldview. Um, um, so the, yeah, it's very much like a, a, a Rousseauian idea of, um, of what do you mean the by human it? person. The idea that like human beings are blank slates or that the, the reason why we have morals or governments or all of the things of society all come from um, uh, the environment that we're in as opposed to um, maybe a more 
uh, um, an older, maybe more Christian view, more medieval view that says that human beings are also sort of you, you come built with um, – you're not a blank slate that you actually have um, by being made in God's image that that has some sort of um, more meaning than just sort of being this blank slate. Yeah, I, I, if you really pick apart the blank slate, you, like human beings can't be blank slates or we would never learn language. But anyway, that's, that's sort of besides the point. You need to have some sort of concept of grammar if sure. you're going to be able to learn. Yeah, there are parts of your brain that are, are there for learning language. Yeah. The Vernica and Broca's region, right? So I feel like a pure blank slate, someone who really wants to hold to a pure blank slate version of the human person has an, a huge battle to, to win. Like, I, I don't think, I think it's a, it's, you it's can't depend, hold yeah. that view. It depends what you mean. Because like, you know, exactly, yeah. kids know how to breathe when they come, you know, like. Exactly, so, yeah. But I, I don't think no one would refute that point. They're mm-hmm. saying more on like the personality side or the, the personality side, and then just that that um, uh, that society comes from sort of this place of blankness that, mm-hmm. and we sort of all invented it. Mm-hmm. So the, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Let yeah, me just read sure. the the Frankenstein view, and then I can sort of posit these two views that I think are important for ancient and modern man. So the monster is speaking, and he's talking about Felix, who's instructing Safi from this history book. The book from which Felix instructed Safi was Volney's Ruins of Empires. I should not have understood the pur- purport of this book had not Felix, in reading it, given very minute explanations. He had chosen this work, he said, because the declamatory style was framed in imitation of the Eastern authors. Through this work, I obtained a cursory knowledge of history and a view of the several empires at present in- existing in the world. It gave me an insight into the manners, governments, and religions of the different nations of the earth. I heard of the slothful Asiatics, of the stupendous genius and mental activity of the Grecians, of the wars and wonderful virtue of the early Romans, of their subsequent degeneration, of the decline of that mighty empire, of chivalry, Christianity, and kings. I heard of the discovery of the American hemisphere and wept with safety over the hapless fate of its original inhabitants." These wonderful narrations inspired me with strange feelings. Was man indeed at once so powerful, so virtuous and magnificent, yet so vicious and base? He appeared at one time a mere scion of all the evil principle, and at another as all that be conceived of noble and godlike. To be a great and virtuous man appeared the highest honor that can befall a sensitive being. To be base and vicious, as many on record have been, appeared the lowest degradation." a condition more abject than that of the blind mole or harmless worm. For a long time I could not conceive how one man could go forth to murder his fellow, or even why there were laws and governments. That's the line that sort of triggered me on this. Or even that there were laws and governments. But when I heard the details of vice and bloodshed, my wonder ceased, and I turned away with disgust and loathing. So if I sort of had to— What book was he reading? He was reading, oh man, uh, someone, uh, someone by Volney. I don't know who Volney is. Mm. His book, Ruins of Empires. Oh, interesting. Which is presumably uh, a popular history textbook of the time of, uh, of, of Mary Shelley. It's not a book I'm familiar with. Um, but um, if you sort of said, had to take from that, all right, what's the monster's view of, of government and politics and laws? What would it be? Why does he think that we have government and laws? To keep us from, because the line was, if virtue is excellent, then there's no need of government. Yes. So it's to protect us from vice. It's yeah. To, it's protection from um, people who aren't virtuous. Yeah. The reason that we have government and laws is to, yeah, is essentially to stop bad things from happening. Yeah. Um, and isn't there, an, there? There's a section from Aristotle on this. I, I wish I could remember it better. But he basically, or maybe it was early Plato, when in the early Plato episodes, mm-hmm. but that laws are only there because we are too afraid to seize the power that we all want. Like, mm-hmm. we would rather mm-hmm. be the person yeah. in charge getting one over on everybody else, but because we don't think we can, and we're more likely to suffer, it's basically a communal agreement to prevent somebody from taking all that so that we don't suffer so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you told, yeah, so if you sort of ask students, hey, why do we have a government or why do we have police forces and why do we have these sorts of things, you know, to, 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 to keep society in line, to, to keep people from, from going out and harming their fellow person. This is why we have laws and government. And um, I think the key point is we wouldn't need it if we were perfect. 
If we were virtuous, we wouldn't need government and law. And that's the point to your questioning? Yeah. Okay. I think, and so this is, um, and this sort of goes back to kind of the more romantic view of the human person or the, the noble savage or these kinds of things that, um, that there, there is a sort of a state wherein there is this um, kind of blissful anarchy where you do not need government, you do not need law, right. maybe more importantly, you do not need hierarchy. That if you were sinless or if you were virtuous, you don't need hierarchy anymore. Yeah, yeah, you, you could all sort of live together in, in harmony. I'm trying to pull up um, uh, Eve Simone has a book on this also, General Theory of Authority. I don't know if mm. the, essentially the same question of in, um, in a perfect society is government, is organization still necessary? I had to look up the title of the book. The answer being yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll be curious if you go at it the same way. Well, uh, I think for the modern person, I think if I if students sort of work through this, the majority of them would say we don't need government, we don't need order, we don't need a hierarchy if we had perfect people. Right. The only the reason why we have government is because of sin and vice, and, and people are trying to hurt you and kill you and take your stuff, and so right. we have government to make sure that doesn't happen. So, do you want to start a swing at the answer of why we need government, if not? No, oh. I, 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 I want to posit that as the, sort of the one view. Okay. So, in other words, government is created by man to protect. to protect human beings or created by man for human flourishing, sure. if you want to put it that I, way. Yeah, I mean, this is the libertarian position too, mm-hmm. right? That the, the purpose of government is um, uh, protection and um, war and, you know, like fire departments and police departments. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, they should totally step out of everything else. And even if the libertarian party in the, in the United States is small— that's kind of a language that's pervaded into both Democrat and Republican. Right? Yeah, it fits very easily into if you believe that sort of nature and the world around you um, is sort of uh, uh, if all there is, it, it fits easily into materialism. So if, if the world has no hierarchy to it, if the world has no created order other than just matter mm-hmm. um, and human beings come and they can sort of superimpose their order on top of, of, what, of anything, sure. um, that government is, is essentially a human creation based out of. A biological need or a human creation based out, off of a human need for safety and protection and that kind of thing. And I, I would posit that I don't think in the Middle Ages that's how they conceived of government. Mm-hmm. Um, government was not something that was made by God. Uh, sorry, it was made by man. Government was something that God did. Mm. That there is a govern there was a government in b- before the fall. There sure. was a hierarchy before the fall. Um, if you think of the Middle Ages, they had all sorts of wacky um, uh, hierarchies, right? Like they had like seven dominions, principalities, mm-hmm. angels, cherubs, seraphs, right? I don't even know them all. Um, but that there, that before the fall, there was organization, there was structure, and then there was a government. That God himself even has a government inside of him. God the Father and, and the Son, the Son's eternal obedience to the Father is, is kind of like this government. Mm-hmm. Um, this relationship. Um, and so I think, yeah. So, uh, so government isn't a product of the fall. It's not a product of sin or necessitated by sin. It's not made by human beings. Yeah. Um, so that, that, um, what government is and should be is a, uh, a partaking in, in something that God does in God's nature. So just as the creation of art is partaking in God's creative abilities, this is sort of an often cited, you know, this is something that we as Christians say why we, we make beauty is because we are partaking in God's creative ability. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason we have government, um, yes, it does do those things of stopping bad things from happening. But even if all bad things stopped happening, we would still want to have a government. We would want we by by having a structure and order to society. Now that I, I this goes wrong, uh, and we'll talk about how both of these things go wrong in a second. And I don't know if even if I if I fully buy the medieval argument of government, but um, uh, we do this not because of practical necessity, but because of almost cosmological reality. Universe is ordered in hierarchy. And so human society is also going to be ordered in hierarchy, even if everybody is virtuous. Well, there also would have been remnants of Plato floating around in the Middle Ages, Mm -hmm. right? Because Plato is still one of the most influential writers for them. And so they would still think some people are kind of built to be farmers, right? They're not built to run things. Yeah. 
I was just looking. Is that what you're about to argue for? No, I was looking in preparation for this podcast. I also just looking, refreshing myself a little bit on Aristotle. And I think in the, I think this is a way that the Middle Ages differ from Aristotle. Aristotle still has the like the practical. We have government to for human flourishing, Mm -hmm. so we don't hurt each other. Right. Whereas I think in the Middle Ages they push it further and say even if none of us hurt each other, even if we were all perfectly virtuous saints, we would still do government because it is partaking in God's cosmos. So. And then the government that was created was supposed to also mirror the government of, of how they viewed how God works. So you mm-hmm. have the king who was in charge, and then you had his vassals, and then below the vassals you had the peasants, and um, everybody had a relationship to one another. So the job of the vassals was to sort of make war because they could raise an army? So were they the spirited element? Kind yeah, of? They, yeah. if you want to go platonic on it, yes, you could do it that way, that the, ra- that the king was like the reason and the, the, the vassals were like the, 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 the fighters and then the peasants were the, you know, the, the peasants yeah. who worked in and Sorry, I got artisans. Plato on the brain. No, that's <laughs> fair. Yeah. Um, I don't know how far. In the, the, th- the other thing is, is about the Middle Ages is that um, th- this is something I want to talk about at the end of the podcast is that we've got sort of our own modern – ways that we were taught about the Middle Ages. Like, no Middle Age person would have understood what you meant if you said, oh, you live in a feudal system. <laughs> right, right? Exactly. like sure. the feudal system is something that we invented in the 20th century to talk about the Middle Ages. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, but in the, in the Middle Ages, if you went and you talked to somebody and you talked about the way society was organized, they would say, well, this is the way the universe is organized. Wow. Um, we have So, England is a mini cosmos mm. And King Henry II is a is a god is like God, um, and uh, and uh, the, the we are and, and then like the, the the knights are like angels and the peasants are like us. Mm. You know the, the, they would say this is this is the way that it's organized. Um, Henry has a responsibility to be like God to his people, and if you are a tyrant, you are not do, doing your responsibility. Um, God's responsive, you know, the way that God shows his love for people is that he sacrifices himself for them. He dies for them. He serves them. He creates an environment where people can live and survive. Mm. God as good king made the Garden of Eden, planted Adam and Eve in it. Henry as good king makes a good England for his people to thrive and survive in it, right? This is, this is sort of how they would see it. And Mm. then, then the peasants had a responsibility the same responsibility that Adam and Eve did, obedience. And um, and so they would, yeah, so the, the conception of government is that it is a, a, a partaking in God's cosmos. Does this make yes. sense? It makes sense. I, I guess eventually I'll be curious of how that sets up a government governmental system that's different from ours. That's one question. And then also... Wait, what do you mean? Um, just l- let me throw oh, both of them out there. Sure. And then the other one is that to paint that picture makes it sound like everyone th- this just stick with me everyone has a place and like it there's like a comfort to that of knowing that that mirrors like a divine reality but i i don't know if that's how we would tell the story of history of like people like there's still revolution there's still conflict not everyone likes the place that they are sure. in that society and not everyone liked the kings and not yes. everyone liked the kings and the kings often and the kings didn't act like god yeah and maybe i'm wondering is that that's that's well, the first most one. of the kings. most <laughs> of the kings. Yeah. but that's uh, is it that first one is then does that lead to the degradation like so we set up this ideal of the government is set up this way to mirror again like you know god's reality but then there's so much failure that we then get to this place where we say well it can't actually do that but it can you know, uh, run a garbage system, and it can run a fire department. Yeah, I, I think the big change comes when you when you cross over from we are trying to reach the ideal that God has, and we're trying to to bend society to be like that ideal, a form of government. If you want to go even Platonic of it, um, we are trying to create society to um, uh, imitate this the ideal way of society, and then it uh, to, and then the, the line is crossed when you say. No, 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 no. We invent this from our own reason, our own abil- our own way of thinking through this. And so we don't need to have it be a king at the top and everybody else. We could invent it in however many ways that we want. So and when becomes, that idea took over, that yeah. began to begin the, 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 the time of rebellion and revolutions, like the French Revolution. So maybe, maybe part of it is that it becomes sort of decoupled from a teleological model. 
right? There's no, yeah. we sort of have an end for government and that's mm-hmm. for our own safety, but there's no model for what the government should look like because there, there was no perfect government. There's nothing to aim at. And so we, we are left to sort of remake it without any guidebook. Does that make so sense? So this is going to sound, and I may lose you on this, but maybe some listeners will will, will appreciate this. Sorry. Don't don't appeal to the masses. <laughs> yeah, seriously. No, no. What I, kind the of way garbage I like is thinking that? about it fallacy. is, I like thinking about it in the way that European soccer teams organize themselves. So it's kind You've of like two, me. I know, y'all lost you. There's two, there's not two schools of thought, but broadly speaking, there are some kinds of coaches that have a philosophy of how the game should be played. We So, for example, my favorite team in the world, Ajax, which plays in Amsterdam, they have a view of how the game should be played. They have a teleological view of football, of soccer. The game should be played in this way. And Wait, we, what do you mean? Football hmm? or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, use, I'll, do, I'll say soccer. There's a teleological way that soccer should be played, <laughs> and we will train all of our players to do this. And we have this ideal, and sometimes we play to that ideal, but most of the times we don't. And then there are coaches who are pragmatic, and it's like, we will change what we do. All we, we will hoof the ball up the field if we need to. We will. We, who cares if it's beautiful? We just want to score more goals than everybody else, and we'll do that with every means possible. I kind of feel like it's that kind of divide. The Middle Ages has a philosophy of government that there are a, tele, a telos of government that they're trying to to fit into. Well, a teleological model of government. Like yeah. there's, they. I think it all sort of has the same end. Yeah. Like, yeah. protection and organization of the human race but there's one model that they saw as like this was the functional one that met all the requirements no 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 yeah i think it's even stronger than that because government would do different this things. is the only way that government should be because yeah. it's the way god ordered the. that's universe. what i mean and yeah, so yeah. you take away that model we still have the same telos but mm-hmm. we have all kinds of different ways of getting there and mm-hmm. we have no perfect model to look at yeah anymore <laughs> and then and then the 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 modern man sort of looks at it sort of pragmatically and it's like oh the reason we have government is to stop these bad things from happening so if we can stop these bad things from happening that's what government is for and so it's pragmatic is maybe the wrong way to say it but to fit to the soccer analogy that's kind of the way to think about it it's it's this pragmatism way of government however we do it uh, we we can maybe figure out we can maybe if we can tweak the system enough, we could probably um, um, get to the way of, of eliminating all of these bad things. And um, the elimination of bad things ends up being a really interesting sticking point because for the modern person, uh, the modern view of government has in the back of the mind, if you keep changing it, if you keep tweaking it, if you keep putting in new things, if you keep applying new data science to it, we can get to the point where the perfect system of government can create perfect society. Hmm. And the medieval view has something different. It says we had perfect society and we abandoned it when we fell. Hmm. And so now every attempt at government is to, um, we should be trying to imitate perfect society again because that's the way that God's universe has set up. Uh, And we're always going to fail at it because of the sinfulness of man. Um, But Mm -hmm. we should not abandon the pro. We should not abandon the 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 actual form of it. Oops, hit my mic. We shouldn't abandon the form of it. We should keep the form of it. Um, Whereas the modern person says, "Well, we we can change the form all we want because uh, we need to find the the one that's going to work for the time." Or or and so every time it doesn't work, we're like, "Well, that wasn't it. Got to move on to something else." Yeah. Hmm. So um, so if you are a modern person. The killing of Henry, or so the killing of Louis the Sixteenth. No, Louis the Sixth, Fifteenth was the king of France in 1789. What you doing? Oh, that's how I remember it. Louis the Sixteenth. What you doing yeah. there? Okay, just singing. Um, cool. Never heard that so song before. The, um, uh, the, uh, um, the killing. So if you are a modernist, the killing of Louis the Sixteenth ends up being like a necessary step for putting in this thing that you think mm-hmm. is going to make society better. Mm-hmm. And if you have the medieval view of mind, the killing of Louis the Sixteenth ends up being something tantamount to um, uh, a blasphemy, a destru- right. you know, a, a, a destruction of the holy order. Hmm. Um, and so this is why you have almost you've got these two points of view that can no longer sort of talk to each other. Um, the, these these views are are sort of now incompatible that you cannot. Um, sort of come to a consensus because you're working off really completely different um, playbooks if you want. And the question is ans- ultimately answered in violence, not in discussion. In yeah. Anyway. Um, or violence. And violence is the only answer yeah. um, to overthrow. Because those two conversations, those two sides can't talk mm-hmm. to each other. 
So, I mean, when we're growing up and we do medieval history and English class or in history class or whatever, we have, I don't know if you had this experience. This was definitely the experience I had that everything was kind of like, um, chugging towards the, uh, you know, the, the better way of enlightened, uh, the enlightenment modernity. Right. And, uh, and then when we finally got like charters and, um, and, you know, and sort of modern society, we were now in a better place. And yeah, maybe we had to uh, throw off the old shackles of the divine right of kings. Um, but that was a, a sort of a necessary thing. Ah, the French did it in a bloody way. The Americans did it in a less bloody way. So let's, you know, focus more on that one than the French one. You know, mm. like I definitely had this kind of everything is moving up and better view of history mm-hmm. taught. Um, sure. And, and, and maybe I think, yeah. Um, uh, I think the modern, you know, the modern represent Republican representative government of the United States is better for everybody's practical daily life than the uh, um, than the monarchy of the Middle Ages. Um, that's not really the point. Of or the, the po- oligarchy of France. Yeah, the point of uh, of this of this discussion is not to uh, really to sort of debate the merits of either of those things, but it's just to sort of point out um, that uh, the. W- Ultimately, the way that we sort of tell the, hist- the the story of history often is influenced by um, whether we're on the the modern side mm. or whether we're on the the medieval side. Well, uh, to to be super lame with this, right? History is written by the victors. Sure. So, if a revolution works, of course, the old government was bad and terrible and worse than the mm-hmm. current government. Right? Mm-hmm. And so, after a series of revolutions, you're going to have folks that see that as a horrible like. Monarchy is mm-hmm. bad. It's really weird when I actually, so when I went growing up to, to sort of speak to that feeling, I, I always thought Kings were like King equals bad, sure. right? King is always bad. And that, yeah. that's why it just flummoxed me how the British people love their Royal family. Mm-hmm. I was like, I do not understand why they keep a queen and King around. Mm-hmm. Those guys are tyrants, mm-hmm. right? King was synonymous with tyrant growing mm-hmm. up in the U S and I was just totally baffled by it. And then you begin reading some of these old writers and, a a good and virtuous king is a good thing mm-hmm. because he he can get stuff done really fast if he's actually a good king right there there are kings that the people like unanimously loved everybody loved their king he did a great job he cared about his people he was virtuous hard working hardy right and he could get a lot done cuz nobody could stand in his way right. right the closest we have to it now is a ceo if if so, you yeah, know, like exactly. if, if yes. you had a, a a leader of a company that had a uh, a um um, a open-hearted view towards his employees, or you know, like you like make Tom Hanks a CEO, <laughs> and that would be like yeah. a good, a good king, yeah. right? So, I, I after sort of reading all these old things, I thought, okay, maybe there can be good kings, and what does that look like? But that was purely an influence of the educational system. Mm-hmm. King equaled bad, right? Yeah. Um, now, there's a way that both of these sort of views of the government go bad, and maybe both of them are tied into the cosmos, maybe a view of the cosmos, maybe the Middle Ages view of what makes the perfect government is tied into the cosmos of God's hierarchy. And, and our current view is also tied into the view of the cosmos that it's random and man-made and only matter? Yeah, or that it's that it's um, chaos that needs the, the intellect of man to bring order to it. Sure. If that's, yeah, maybe yeah. that's the view of the cosmos. Yeah, that. we are fixing something that is broken as opposed to trying to get back to something. Or making whatever we want because we were randomly yeah. made anyway, so we might as well make something that we enjoy. Yeah, yeah. that it's, that, again, it's it's a pragmatic thing yeah. or a utilitarian thing that we, sure. we're trying to make it the best for everybody. Yeah. Sure. Um, and I think so, in all yeah, this is ahead. the benefit of, yeah, uh, this, uh, AJ, this was your last episode, right? About there's a... Progression is not the right word. It's a, it's a descent that there um, is a good form of government that is then degraded and degraded and degraded. And then does Plato actually talk about it ending in rebellion? I don't know if we... We we have not hit... Well, rebellion already happened when we went to democracy, okay. right? We threw off the shackles of... I think it's oligarchs. Okay. when Because we, we go from Monarch. aristocracy, the true okay. rule of the great, to timocracy, which is the rule of the honorable, right? Yep. So warlike states. And then we go to the oligarchs, those who want money, and then we throw off the oligarchs, go straight to democracy, and then we open ourselves up to tyranny because we get real tired of democracy, and then... But then does someone overthrow the tyrant, or is that not a category? I I assume eventually we kill the tyrant, and then it probably just goes back to democracy. So then we... I don't know. He didn't... He hasn't talked about that yet. It just... 
Maybe we hit a loop of like democracy, tyranny, democracy, tyranny. And and, uh, yeah, I think that's the benefit of learning about Plato. Same with Aristotle. This is what AJ was just saying that when Aristotle puts monarchy as like the best form of government, he, that should, that should challenge us. Like that doesn't sound right to me. And that feeds into the medieval idea Yeah. Or it's like, Oh, of course, of course this pagan realized what's actually true about the cosmos. Yeah. But then, Aristotle does have a category for the worst form of government is tyranny. It's Mm -hmm. there. It's a, it's a mirror. The top three is mirrored inversely in the bottom three because an absolute ruler um, who is good is the best form, but an absolute ruler who is bad is the worst form is is absolutely. And so then in many ways, the modern, the modern experiment is like, okay, well let's, let's stop doing this min max game where we have the best and the worst. And let's just sort of go for a better with a sort of a okay middle. And that's yeah. Democracy for Aristotle is the fourth best option. It's the best of the bad options, but in the same way, that's a pragmatic thing to say, well, therefore go for that. Mm -hmm. Does that make, yeah. 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 That's interesting. Now there, so they, the story of how the medieval the middle ages goes bad is the familiar one that we're taught. We're never really sort of taught about how the modern form of conception of government can go bad. Although I think we can intuit it or we can figure it out. But the, the one that we were, at least I remember what I was taught was at some point, the Kings thought they were completely um, divine and that they could, you know, like the Egyptian gods of old, Henry the 14th thought, or Louis the 14th thought that he was the sun King, that he was God himself. Um, and so this is the Middle Ages sort of overshooting itself, and it became tyranny. I think there's a lot of fairness to that, um, that, 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 that is true. Um, but it does not necessarily have to follow, therefore, that we get rid of King's whole cloth. But that is what the, the sort of the, the Enlightenment wanted to do, wanted right? to do yeah. and ended up doing. Sure. Um, um, but uh, so, yeah, so the, the medieval form of government goes bad when you have bad kings and um, then you have tyrants and you go from the what would be what was what Aristotle or maybe what the Middle Ages said was the best form or maybe even the only form of government, one that mirrored God's cosmos. And then you have this terrible situation where you have these kings, you know, you've got um, uh, you've got Prince John in England and you have these sort of terrible situations and life is miserable. Um, but. Um, but when you had a bad king, everybody knew what the solution was. Replace the king. Get a good. Get a. Get get we a need. One. We will pray that we have that his son is a better man, sure. right? Um, but then or we, get in his cousin. Or get yeah. Or get you find somebody out. Find get, one of the other nobles. Yeah. Get has, Henry the yeah. Fourth to beat out. You know yeah. to get Richard the Second out. Right. Like yeah. get get somebody who is in the line to who's supposedly supposedly supposed to be better. Um, and then in the um. The modern form, there's the belief that just somewhere over the rainbow is the magic formula that we're going to have that is going to solve the problems. And I know we talked about this in our Crime and Punishment podcast um, when we talk about the great man and the and the someone who can finally reorganize society to turn it into into the best way. Um, uh, even C.S. Lewis uh, talks about this that like. Um, um, we no longer, yeah. The, what, what, what we try to do is uh, fix people as opposed to punish people. Um, that's a, maybe another rabbit trail to go down. But uh, um, that there's the the progressive or the modern view of government is one that is perfectible. It's the yeah the myth of human perfectibility. Although what's kind of funny to me is that I mean I could be I would be happy to be proven wrong about this, but. It seems like we 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 hold that idea that human society and human government and the human is per- perfectible, but nobody has put out a comprehensive vision of utopia in the last 60, no, 70 years. Can't, we can't do it. I mean, well, that's the thing. Like we had like Marx, right? Didn't didn't Marx put forward like here is a good organizational he, like here it is. Here's the utopia. Sure. I figured it out. Here's the idea. I haven't seen anything since then. Oh, you mean somebody who's actually earnestly believing that they could. That they could do it. Like, they could write I, something that, that I was... I figured it out. It seems like right now we have a lot of voices, but not not any single one of them is giving a comprehensive view of here is the actual... Here it is. Here's the vision of utopia that we can work towards. Like, maybe it's something small, like, okay, healthcare. They focused on one particular element of that utopia, but nobody has put forward a comprehensive view. Not to, I could be wrong. Not to date the episode, but wouldn't that be potentially Senator Sanders of like a, a move from uh, into socialism, yeah. but isn't his just kind of borrowing from Marx? 
uh, I'm not saying that he's like innovating in some huge way, but I mean, proposals that are, I mean, um, I, f- I forget if the number is $60 trillion, or like it, it's total overhauls of yeah. um, the healthcare system. Um, the and tax. Ta- and, tax scheme. Right. Um, wealth. So AJ, you're saying there's nobody coming out that's proposing a new philosophy, but there's tons of people coming out proposing how to make the old philosophies work today. Mm. Yes, yeah. but and maybe not even realizing that that's what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Fair. I think that's fair. I mean, maybe there is no political. Maybe there is no more political innovation that can happen, and it's and now it's just um, it's arguing over the right way to play the game. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and the Middle Ages had their view, and then modern man has this other view, this sort of pragmatic view. Mm-hmm. But how it goes wrong if the if the Middle Ages how it goes wrong is you have a bad king. How it goes wrong for. Uh, sort of this, the, the more enlightenment view of government is that it has to be perpetual revolution. Like it has to be trying something, trying something. Oh my goodness, this didn't work. Burn it down. Try something, try something, try something. Oh my goodness, this didn't work. Burn it down. And then uh, what I find fascinating is that both the Enlightenments and the, and the Medievals, they, they can criticize each other's view. Mm-hmm. So the Enlightenment looks at the Medieval and say, well, how can you guys you know, like stand having a crappy king? But the Medieval view can also look at the Modernists and say, um, you are trying for a perfect society, but we had it. And when we, even when we had it and had no sin, we abandoned it. So what makes you think that you can get it back? through your work, mm. through your sort of your social engineering and your, and your social organization. You can't. Um, um, so, um, yeah, th- that um, both of them kind of have this misplaced hope that the, uh, the Enlightenment view has a hope in the human perfectibility, that if we can just sort of get the new science or the new data or the new metric, we can, we can finally get the thing sorted. Yeah. And the medieval hope is... I hope we get a good man, <laughs> or I hope we get a good person. Yeah, um, and those are those are sort of different things. Can I try maybe a, sure. a, another thing also that I think is with this of um, when what, Graham, what you're saying tying in with AJ and Plato is that um, there's a descent that we just went through this, but there's a descent of systems. So um, aristocracy into oligarchy into democracy into democracy. Did I get that right? No, uh, aristocracy to democracy to oligarchy, oligarchy. to democracy. democracy tyranny. But those are like those are bad. Whereas Marx, Marx's conception of history is that there's a movement toward a better and better system. Mm-hmm. That it goes from. I'm just reading this off of Marxist.org with my bookmarked homepage. That's a joke. Please don't. Anyway, okay. <laughs> that that history is a movement from primitive communism to slavery to feudalism to capitalism to socialism. Does that like, yeah. It, so then you've got, so it's a progressive view of history to, and that it's moving into the utopia mm-hmm. that that's at the end of these inferior systems. Mm-hmm. Um, which is fascinating. If you go back to our uh, distributism podcast or where we talked about the servile state, yep. they say, yeah, Marx is probably right. But at the end, um, at the end of capitalism is slavery or, or, uh, socialism. And those aren't good things. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, uh, where I also think that this ends up in a fascinating place is that there are many people, uh, there are many sort of historical people who live at times of inflection points. And as modern people, we use them as proxies to explain either the Enlightenment or the medieval way of thinking. The, the, the two that I can think of sort of off the top of my head are Galileo and Thomas More. Mm-hmm. So let's start with Thomas More. So Thomas More um, d- was executed by Henry VIII because he would not allow the marriage to one of the one of the women. Mm-hmm. Was it Jane Seymour? I don't know who it was. Anne Boleyn, maybe. Um, doesn't matter. Um, uh, Thomas More is uh, how I was taught. Thomas More was that he was a hero of law over tyrants. That he loved the law over tyrants, and and, and in very in many ways he is sort of read through that very good play uh, that was done in the 1960s called *Man for All Seasons*, mm-hmm. and the, and the play *The Man for All Seasons* has Thomas More sort of held up as this stoic lover of the legal system and on the rule of law over the whims and, ty- and tyranny of man. And, and, and so he's held up almost as like this enlightenment hero, that right. here he is who, who believes in the written word, the written code of law over, over the vicissitudes of the human person. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have a little quote here from the book that kind of, I think, crystallizes this point. So um, 
um, Thomas Moore is the Chancellor of England, and his buddy Roper says, "Hey, you should arrest that guy because if you he's gonna um, there's this you should arrest this person because he is going to he is your enemy." And Thomas Moore says, "No, I will not. Uh, I will not arrest him. Um, um, even if the devil himself didn't break the law, I wouldn't arrest him." And so Roper says, "So you'd give the devil the benefit of the law?" Thomas Moore replies, "Yes. What would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil?" And Roper says, "I'd cut down every law in England to do that." Yeah, of course I'd go after, um, go after him. And Moore said, "Oh." And when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper? <laughs> the laws all being flat. This country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast. Man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down and you're just the man to do it, do you th- really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil the benefit of the law for my own safety's sake. So, I mean, it's a great passage. Yeah, sure. That's yeah, um, pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. But it is clearly setting Thomas More up as a defender of man's law over the tyranny of Henry VIII. Right. He is a champion of the Enlightenment law over over tyrannical Middle Ages, mm-hmm. um, which is one way to read the Thomas More story. The other way to read the Thomas More story is that here is Henry VIII superseding the cosmos of the universe by going against the church. And wanting to divorce his wife for his own political game and is, is telling Thomas More to get in line over him. You should obey me. And Thomas More says, no, Henry VIII, you are acting outside of God's created order. I'm not going to do that. I would die for that. If we could go back and pick Thomas More's brains and really sort of sit down and talk to him, I'm convinced that he would be more the medieval man than mm. the enlightenment man. But we, we set him up as we, the Enlightenment we have over the Minutemen. Writing man. and stuff. Ah, we've got Thomas More's Utopia. We've got all sorts yeah. of Thomas. We, I mean, and and maybe and maybe it's more complex than this. I'm less concerned about what did Thomas More think about himself, and more interested in how we tell the story, we tell yeah. the story and yeah. how we teach Thomas More right. to sort of bolster uh, a view of of like this sort of progressive history or this progressive government, or we bolster the view of um, I don't know what you want to call it. Wouldn't wouldn't what Thomas More thought about himself have a pretty big bearing on that? Like whether, I don't know, whether he was defending the church and the way things should be or whether he was trying to support man's law. Like, I, I feel like at least knowing what he thought would make a difference. If I was a champion of the Enlightenment, I would hate to be called But what man can actually know what he, thinks? what he thinks in light of how history plays itself out? I mean... I, I would so at least, let me give I would you, at least like to see what he thought. So I'm drawing a hard, I'm maybe incorrectly drawing a hard line between a medieval view and a modern and an enlightenment view. Thomas More probably rightly had this this um, uh, a mix of medieval and modern in his view of the world that made sense to him in his day. Um, but as history moved forward, they and as they sort of were more incompatible views, but they still mixed in his in his intellect when he was alive. I don't know. That's a sort of a bad. I'm trying to think. It's hmm. no. I I get what you're saying, Hannenberg. Um, I think we at least we should at least do a thinking man justice, right, on that particular point. If he is saying yes, man's law, and I I want that's what I want to support, then I would teach him as. And that's the thing is, I would teach him as maybe an Enlightenment man, as opposed to a medieval man. Why? Like you can still. But you, you can still... But if, all of his actions could be explained as somebody who believed in the medieval cosmos, just as all of his actions could be explained as somebody who believed in laws or man's creation. Yes, but I would hate to spend my entire career teaching children and then have someone come and explain my actions away despite my words as like taking advantage of children and trying to put my own ideas over them. That's what I'm trying to over them. look up. The... Uh, you, Anyway, just very quickly doing Google searching, like um, the portrayal in A Man for All Seasons is not 100% accurate to Moore's writings. But again, it deserves more research. And AJ, that's your point. That's my, that's totally, my point. Totally. I would hate to have written down all of my reasons for teaching kids and then have someone come and say, ah, I, he's actually, a product of the moderns. And totally I, guess, I guess the point is then we like history is taught in a way to be digestible, but in order to digest it, we need to turn things into cartoon versions of them or mm. we need to turn things into simplified versions of right. them. And um, 
And maybe that's fine for f- um, in, in more, I don't know, stable times. Maybe it's, pr- maybe it's easier to tell the cartoon version of Henry II because he was right smack dab in the middle of the Middle Ages wherein there was not a lot of diversity of thought on government. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we can sort of say he was, you know, a king who thought he was in this hierarchy like God was in hierarchy. But then when you get to these these points of sort of really big paradigm shifts, to put people on one side or the other of the paradigm shift is is a little bit simplistic. Did um, but how else do you teach it in an hour and twenty five minute class? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but th- but then communicating to the students that it's not as simple as we're making it, I think, is really important. Like, Agreed. did um, you know? Does uh, Luther see himself as a Catholic? <laughs> right? right. Uh, or does he see himself as a Protestant? I was taught that he saw himself as a Protestant. I think irrevocably he saw himself as a Catholic. And you probably, and then if you sat down and talked with Luther, he'd say, I'm a, I'm a reformer, just like um, just like the people 200 years ago were trying to reform the church right. and the council of whatever it was. And, um, that he church. posted his theses not as a rebellion, but as like literally, discussion topics, yeah. right? Literally a reform. But yeah. then he yeah. ends up becoming a, a symbol of something that hap- that is happening later. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, the, the other example is Galileo. Galileo ends up becoming this symbol of the noble scientist against the tyranny of, um, of so, superstition yeah. uh, and, and sort of uh, ignorant uh, um, church teachings. But when you go back and re- – like he is using the – telescope in the Vatican. Like the Vatican had uh, had an observatory. Um, Copernic, like the, the big reason why the church was so grumpy with Galileo is not because of his scientific findings, was because he was then building a new vision of the cosmos that had political ramifications off of those, off of those findings. Copernicus, what, a generation before him, had also posited a heliocentric universe, yep. and everyone was like, oh, yeah, you're probably right. Good. Um, but Copernicus didn't move into then saying, um, therefore, we don't need to uh, you know, right. believe X, Y, and Z about the world. But Galileo, he also puts forward a, a, geocentric, or a heliocentric universe, but then he ties that view of the cosmos to uh, something that was... Um, upheaving the, the 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 view of the cosmos that I guess the church had, and at that point, then it becomes then he's sort of uh, uh, I don't know revolutionary whatever. Um, but the but the, you're saying he did that to himself because he tied those two together. It I'm wasn't... saying the story we tell it is of this like sort of this this dispassionate scientist that says, "Oh, this is the way the universe is." And the church says, oh, no, it's not. Uh, uh, if, if, if that's the way the universe is, our power is ruined. Right. Fuck them up. Right. Um, where in reality, like, um, um, Galileo, it seems as if Galileo also had his own uh, uh, access to grind about sure. power. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so that's what, you know, was, was getting him into trouble with the powers that be. He wasn't this sort of dispassionate scientist who was just telling it like it is. He was using his discoveries to also posit forward a competing vision of government, power, of government and power. Do you know? Do you know when we moved from? So one thing I notice about the way we teach writing in schools is that the way we teach scientific writing tries to remove the human actor. So all sentences are put in passive voice. Right? The mixture was heated to this temperature. Yeah, yeah. It was poured into a like we remove all all pronouns, all people from it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that's the way that scientific men did it for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. They would have their own ideas. They would say, I did this, I did this, I did this, and this is what I'm finding. And then they would draw conclusions. And I'm wondering at what point we moved into a dispassionate, non-human view of science. Um, What was that? Because I imagine both Galileo and Copernicus sort of set forth these visions and then drew conclusions from them. Because we're still talking about the... You know, the medieval Renaissance man who does many things and could do like all sorts of learning. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about about sort of the history of of scientific philosophy, like the philosophy of science. I feel like that'd be really, really interesting. A really interesting. good answer to that. Um, um, if any listeners out there are more familiar with the progression of science and scientific writing and have read, you know, all the writings of Copernicus and Galileo, I'd love to hear about it. So if you want to send me an email. It's not as sort of smooth curve as I think it's often referred to because you have really competing differences of view when it comes to certainty. So you have people like empiricists who uh, – you have Hume who, you know, 
um, when you really uh, break down what uh, the hard empiric- what to our audi- what's what's empiricism. So empiricism for our is that you can only know what is what is it? You can only know what is observable. Is that fair? Is that yes. a Thomas? Yeah, yes. you can yeah. only know what's observable, um, and um, so if you really hold that firmly, um, then make uh, it is hard to make. Oh shoot! I'm gonna get this wrong because I didn't. I haven't thought about this. Um, no, uh, we don't need to jump down this rabbit yeah, trail. Yeah, no, maybe if, this is something for a future yeah. for a future episode. I was just right. curious if you knew anything but the, about but the, the way they the, wrote. Um, there is not a unity of thought when it comes to um, ontology, how you mm-hmm. know things. Although oftentimes it's presented, that there is unity of thought. It's the scientific method, and that's the and that is the sole way of knowing things. But there are people along the sort of uh, the the scientific uh, timeline that come in and say, "Listen, this like." Um, uh, cons- consensus isn't necessarily what we think it is. Well, even um, consensus now. I know many actually Christian scientists, right, that are in the scientific field and are Christians, and so they don't necessarily have a consensus about everything in science. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so, yeah. Sorry, Thomas, what were you saying? I, uh, I've been on a Google rabbit trail trying to find more on Thomas More and sorry anyway I have very little that is helpful the <laughs> other the the analog that came to mind is um um Darwin and um associations of his name with social darwinism mm-hmm. or even the use of survival of the fittest which again this is from a quick search so you know lambast me if this is wrong but even survival of the fittest is not a phrase that originates with Darwin in the same way that the use of social darwinism um predates I believe the publication of the origin of on the origin of species so like the worldview, basically someone hears secondhand the ideas that Darwin is working on and then comes up with a worldview mm-hmm. that fits with what they want. Mm-hmm. Again, Darwin is writing kind of in the in this Gilded Age time. So if, if there's a scientific theory that will back up, um, you know, barons who are uh, robber barons who are um, accumulating assets, mm-hmm. they're going to take that scientific view and use that as like the justification of why it is the way it is. Mm-hmm. But that's almost closer to your original form of government you're describing that these people who are wealthy are wealthy because, you know, nature determines that the best of us will become mm-hmm. the, the, the top of the heap. Does mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm wondering if there are, there is still a telos is still, st- there is still a goal with government or um, an economic system, but it's moved from a religious one to a, an observation, a scientific based. Yeah, that's that, that's fair. Yeah. Um, and maybe so. Maybe both of them are teleological. It's just the the, the telos has been radically changed. Yes. Um, to be an empirical one, which mm-hmm. you just said, it's it's what we can see. We can no mm-hmm. longer point to an ideal that that can't be. But if we can point and say, well, you know, because this is how um, animals behave in nature, therefore we as humanity should build a society that matches that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and those things don't have to flow from each other. Mm-hmm. They can be separate, but we're looking for a telos. We're looking for an end to the, what, the systems we have. Mm-hmm. Um, when I think about this, yeah, when I – this challenges me when it comes to, okay, then how do you, how do, you do history? Right. Uh, how do you uh, – you want to avoid these easy explanations as much as possible – um, but you want to give the student a framework through which they can understand history. Um, but there's really bad, but there are, there's lots of really bad frameworks. I mean, um, the one that always kind of rubs me the wrong way is when someone tries to um, tell the story of history through a pretty um, assured th- way of God's providence sure. that, you know, these things happened because God wanted this to happen. And these things happened because God wanted this to happen. And mm-hmm. America happened because, um, because it was going to be the best, uh, Christian place on earth. And I mean, maybe that's true. Maybe that's not true. Um, but that's, that's a, that is as, um, simplistic, uh, a, a telling of history than saying man is moving towards its greatest perfection through the use of its intellect. Sure. That is a uh, a simplified version of history that I think is uh, um, that one is just what everybody thinks. <laughs> yeah. So are um, you are you just sort of bumping up against the notion that all history has to be taught within some sort of worldview, right? It's it's gonna leak out, no matter how you know what teacher you have or how you do it. It is incredibly difficult to teach history dispassionately and perhaps even impossible. Yeah. And yeah. so how do you how do you teach it in such a way that does honor 
to the subject itself without too much coloring it, it from any particular worldview or by choosing or, or be by being obvious about the worldview. No, I, yeah, I, I don't think that you can say I'm going to not have a worldview because that's you, know, you, you literally that. can't. That itself is um, a worldview. So I think um, I think when Christians, we as Christians, when we teach history, we need to be a little bit more explicit about um, uh, anthropology. This is what man is. This is what this is what God is. This is uh, um, what we know and believe about God's order of the universe, and we will. And this is how we are going to understand our place in the cosmos and the story of humanity. Um, and maybe a little more wary of the undetectable worldviews that we are brought up with. Does that yeah, make sense? that? But it's also, um, I mean, um, I think it's a lot more profitable to to teach history as kind of like one thing after another than. Um, um, like as Christians, we have what has happened, and then we have the future, which we don't know, and then we have the ending, which we believe we do know. Um, um, what am I trying to say with this? Um, I don't think I, – I, I think the, the teacher who unwillingly is slipping into a sort of modern view of history, thinking that they are being objective when really they're having a worldview mm-hmm. about – um, the myth of human perfectibility um, can't do that and um, have a uh, and teach history through a Christian worldview. Maybe that maybe that's what I'm trying to say is that if you think um, you're being um, you're removing your bias from it and you're just teaching objectively, what you're probably actually doing is you're teaching history like a modern person. That's fair. Yeah. Or viewing his like if, if we're talking about like non-teachers, yes. you're viewing history through a certain. Mm-hmm. And that everything is moving towards like bigger and better and we're going to figure it out and everyone's going to be fine. And but, but even you're saying that we need to be somewhat critical or cautious of, of the worldview we hold, that even to, to, to call something a Christian worldview, I think if I heard you correctly, uh, the medieval Christian conception would still be different than the modern Christian conception, right? Like the, mm-hmm. we, uh, our yeah. worldview yeah, still it has... It depends which classical teacher you talk to, I guess. That's fair. But, <laughs> but, just, uh, but just to say that um, our the way we see the world has an has an origin. It comes from somewhere and Mm -hmm. we should be wary of that, Mm -hmm. that what we consider now the right worldview is colored by living in 2020, living in Austin. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, It it gives us a caution also. I think if I'm, if I'm hearing all this correctly. No, that's fair. Hmm. Um, I don't know what the takeaways are from this. Tell history with, tell the stories, uh, tell the stories, but maybe give a little bit of credence and honor to, the perspectives that you're bringing to the table yeah. and discuss those a little bit rather than treat, treat them as tried, you know, done and done. Tried I was going to say tell history honestly, but I almost don't know what that means. Like maybe the takeaway is history is more complicated than we that's make a, it. That's a fine. That's a good takeaway too. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit more like we should just be more me- medieval. There it is. Okay. Um, that's <laughs> a, uh, I should have seen that's where this is always your takeaway. All right. Yeah, this well, is a good one. yeah. We, we probably got to call it z- there. So thank you, Graham. This has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. Graham, I'd also like to know, how old is that shirt you're wearing? Is that from college? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's He's cool. uni- wearing a University of Toronto shirt. That's crazy. And I'm always impressed when people still, like, I wish I still had some of the sweatshirts I had in college. I don't, they, they got lost in, like, the backs of cars. Yeah, this you know what I mean? shirt used to be blue. It's faded oh, it's to, like, much a, faded. It's, yeah. It's, it's great. And the collar's all, like, loose. <laughs> All right. Cool. So this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. And if you'd like to contact us, you can shoot us an email at classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. Our website is classicalstuff.net. You can tweet at us at C-L-S-S-C-A-L stuff. And we'd love to hear from you if you have questions or comments. And I hope you're doing well amidst the the horrors of our time. Yeah. we're. This will come out in the future. We have no idea. Yeah. I don't... We... We are recording right now at the beginning of our spring the, break, our first our spring break okay, which it would be, I guess, the the rise of coronavirus. So either you are listening to this in the decline of coronavirus <laughs> and you are safe and you have an abundance oh. of toilet paper. <laughs> there it is. Or there is a dearth of toilet paper and you are in desperate, Dire straits, no. yeah. desperate need. Lord so our, either way, our prayers go out to you, listener. So sure. we're we're standing with you in this. And on that somber note, I will say goodbye. Bye.